Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Mr. President, Mr. Lakhani, dear friends. The center belonging to the Smiley community feels like a home for me because throughout my life, in one way or another, as Mr. Lakhani summarized for you, I've been associated in some ways with the Smiley community since when I was an instructor, not a professor at Harvard a few years older than the person who was to become the imam of the community and has been so for over 50 years. He was very, very close to me. He used to come to our house all the time. I eat as much Persian food from my mother's cuisine as I have practically, and uh, whom I have always loved very much. And in the older days, I used to be oftentimes be consulted by him on many matters, including matters of Islamic architecture and art and his quest for knowledge was something insatiable and really a divine gift, which is also a gift for the Smiley community with the emphasis upon education, which the community has been carrying out both here in Europe in exile communities as well as within Pakistan and India, and later on the establishment of a major university in Central Asia after the fall of the Soviet Union and the Al Khan University itself in Pakistan, the branch in London, and many, many other activities of the kind. I feel honored that throughout my life, I've had the opportunity provided to me by God to be in a humble way associated with some of the very important efforts that the Al Khan carried out in these matters. But uh, tonight, I'm not going to talk about these cooperations. I'm going to be talking about a subject which was chosen by the people who invited me and honored me in delivering the inaugural talk of this beautiful new center and that is the question of religion, secularism, and the environment. First of all, it's a remarkable fact itself. Uh, 50 years ago, not a single Islamic center would have ever invited a public lecture to talk about the environment. The fact that this is done itself is a turning of a page. Do not think it's insignificant. Uh, we have a long history as to why it took uh, the Islamic world such a long time to become aware of the environmental crisis, and especially the religious scholars in the Islamic world. I shall turn to that in a moment, but the first thing I want to say is that there's no issue more important in the world today, besides, of course, the spiritual life of man and woman, than the environment. I read a wonderful sign somewhere in your city that we're all the guests of the environment. That's right, we're very bad guests, however, who are killing our hosts left and right by just existing. Modern man by just existing destroys the world. That's, that's, to be modern is to destroy the world of nature. That's the great tragedy of it, and we shall try to find out why. The environment, environmental crisis is a, not only a reality, it's the central reality of life. And it's a very great tragedy as soon as there's a little economic downturn in the main motor of the destruction of the environment, which is Western civilization, especially the United States, immediately the environmental issue is forgotten. It's not even spoken about by people in the Democratic Party who are supposed to be its defenders, not to talk about the Republicans who live on another planet in which there is no environmental crisis. <laughs> but, but for those who live on this planet, even for them, this is something that is oftentimes put aside as soon as another very small issue compared to the possible disaster and catastrophes that we're going to, say, to face comes up. And this is not true only of the West, it's true of every country in the world. After the great disaster in Japan, the, ra the radioactivity, which is still around in Japan, you all heard, for a while there were these big posters in opposition totally to Western technology and uses of atomic power. But uh, the insistence of every country to try to live in a way which is totally in contrast with harmony with nature, what we call modern life, brought back the insistence of the government that uh, somehow they were going to fix the situation in one way or another, and the opposition gradually died out. But nevertheless, despite the fact that we live in a world in which the powers that be do everything possible to prevent people from waking up to this crisis, with all kinds of lullabies to keep us asleep. Nevertheless, there is a gradual rise in awareness that if you do not come to understand a correct relationship with the world of nature, we're not going to be around. We're not going to be around to even talk about the future. 
It's all, uh, we call in Persian, just poetry in the negative sense, share. It's not uh, really serious. I didn't I want to insult poetry, of course, I love poetry, but I'm using a Persian expression when you want to say something that's not serious, it says share, that in the sense that it's just words, not real substance. And so I think uh, it is every op important to take every opportunity possible, every opportunity possible to come back to this issue. I've spent over 50 years, over 50 years of my life, thinking and writing and lecturing about this matter. From the days when as a young student at Harvard or MIT, I used to walk alone around Walden Pond about one o'clock in the morning when there was nobody else around. The, wall, the pond, Bosch with Thoreau wrote his classical book and meditating upon nature and what was happening to the, what I, uh, Mr. Lachan just mentioned, Route 128, which suddenly cut off the outer part of uh, nature from the greatest city of Boston to the so-called belt that is still used and no longer animals were able to cross and to come into uh, Arlington where I used to live. From that time until now, much of my intellectual activity and spiritual activity has been spent on this matter. I'm sort of a kind of a veteran wounded in many, many wars that have been carried out, very difficult ones. I gave the keynote address at the first Earth Day in Stockholm, which was a very difficult task when the Soviet Union at that time and China both thought that the environmental crisis was a capitalist uh, plot carried out by capitalism and that communist countries had no crisis whatsoever. And I had to give the keynote address and it got me so angry when the Soviet delegate was sitting like this in front of it and somebody said, made this asinine statement. And he said, I know no, of no more communist river than the Volga. It's a purely communist river from up to, uh, in sources until it flows into the Caspian Sea. And it pollutes the next thousand kilometers all the way to the coast of Persia, of Iran, of Gilan and Mazandaran. And all the fish being environmentalists, all of the fish that you try to put, uh, 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 cultivate in the north, as soon as they're wise enough, they all swim and come south. That's what much of what's called Russian caviar is really Persian caviar. They just call it Russian caviar. <laughs> <laughs> the caviar refused to stay up in the north. And I got the Soviets very, very angry, just got up and walked out. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> they fell, the Soviet Union fell apart. And as soon as they fell apart, they found out that two thirds of all the rivers of Poland were so polluted that they could no longer be used. And 30 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, much of Southern Russia and many of the Eastern European countries are extremely polluted. Not that the West is much better, but at least in the West, some people came to recognize it. So I've had uh, experience of speaking a great deal about this matter to many different audiences, from the highest authorities to students, to hippies, to uh, uh, industrialists and the like. But tonight this is primarily uh, an audience that I believe is mostly Muslim and is uh, mostly perhaps Ismaili or related to matters pertaining to Islamic civilization. And so rather than speaking only in general terms, I will uh, try to narrow down my comments mostly to the Islamic world, but not completely. The first question to ask is the beginning of the title of my talk is religion, is what role does religion play in the environment? The answer to this question contains a great paradox, great paradox. There's no doubt, although many have tried to deny it, after I wrote The Man and Nature, many of the articles, many people have come around to realize this, that as long as man, men and women, of course, by man I mean homo and son, not male, as long as men were lived according to religion, there was no environmental crisis. No one can deny that. Saying that the goats were eating up the trees in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, that's the same thing as having the Hudson River polluted and all this kind of nonsense like that is really irrelevant. It's not true in the science or philosophy or anything else, or history for that matter. There's no doubt that as long as human beings lived according to religion, we didn't have an environmental crisis. Secondly, the environmental crisis started in that one part of the world where humanity decided to push religion to the side, not to totally destroy it, but marginalize it, that's the West. 
The environmental crisis began in the Ruhr Valley, in Lowell, Massachusetts, in, in Liverpool, places like that, where industries began heavily in the 18th century, where writers like Charles Dickens began to write about the monstrosities of the time. By that time, it was small enough and nature big enough, so you moved to the next hill and you didn't have to worry. To this very day, when you travel in the Midlands of England, you see this beautiful green valley, and then you come up the hill, the next is just completely black soot. You, you have to hold your nose to go through, and then you come to the next valley again. Same in Pennsylvania. Very, very similar situation to these hilly states in the eastern part of the United States, which have the oldest history of industrialization. So this is a historical fact, that uh, the environmental crisis begins by that part of the human collectivity which decided to marginalize religion. No one can really dispute that. All of the secularists today are against what I'm saying. Hundreds of books have been written to try to say, no, religion is at fault. I shall come to that in a moment. But this fact is not to be refuted because it's impossible to refute it. However, at the same time, at the same time, we see that in the West, 90% of the people who are very much interested in the environment are secularists. Not all. 50 years ago, it was 100%. When I, I always give this story. When I published Man and Nature, the University of Chicago came all the way to Tehran to invite me to give the Rockefeller Series lectures because Mircea Eliade, the great historian of religion, was one of the very few people aware of the significance of the environmental crisis of which nobody spoke at that time and know the role of religion in it. He had written about the religions of India and the importance of nature. He was a very exceptional Romanian scholar. So he sent the professor of chemistry, John Rust, all the way to the Middle East to accept me to, uh, to invite me to give the lectures, which I did. At that time, the greatest, although the audience had many theologians, it was sponsored by the Department of Science and the Divinity School of uh, Chicago together. There were many theologians there and the many scientists and liberal arts and so forth, the greatest opposition to what I had to say came from Christian theologians. That's only in the 1960s, that's only 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you would not, could not find a single Christian theologian who tried to defend nature against its abuse from a Christian point of view. The, why is this so? This is the same religion that produced Francis of Assisi, who, talk, who talked to the birds and wrote that beautiful address to the sun and the moon. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Uh, this is a very complex matter. I cannot go into it now, but uh, very quickly, it was the rise of the scientific revolution. The fact that the Catholic Church burned its hands with the uh, Galilean trials. And after that, decided not to have anything more to do with the cosmos, with the world of nature. And they said, we don't care whether you say the world is square or trapezoid or rectangle. That's not our business. Ours is the way of love. And no religion can be the way of love alone. It has to have something about the world of nature. Say so something about the world of nature. It has to have knowledge. And just a sentimentality is not going to do it. 300 years passed from the Galileo trial until the Catholic Church realized that they had to have a doctrine about the world of nature. Protestantism, although early in the 16th century, including Martin Luther himself, who was a keeper of the fish, he was a keeper of the fish in a pond in Germany, and early Protestantism, there were thinkers in it, up to the 17th century uh, theosophers, so-called German theosophers, uh, there were people who were interested in nature, but gradually died out, and uh, Protestantism became very acosmic, totally indifferent to the world of nature. It did not produce one single major thinker about nature. So what happened in the West is that in the 19th century, when a reaction sent, was set in, especially first in Germany, and then in England, and lesser, to a lesser extent in France, against this new ugly modernization and industrialization that people were seeing, the reaction didn't come from Christian circles. It came from people like William Blake. It came from people like Wordsworth. It came from Lord Alfred Tennyson. 
Tennyson was learning Arabic when he was going blind. He was not at all interested in Christianity anymore. Wordsworth, but then neither and Blake was considered to be a pagan. And, you know, the Christian church considered him to be a pagan. Always one of the deepest religious poets of the English language. But he wrote some of the deepest poetry about nature. All of you know the, his uh, this famous poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, poems like that which really uh, praise the beauty of the, and power of nature. But the mainstream religion in Europe was concerned with other issues. Theology, morality, politics, all kinds of other issues. And because at that time, Western religion began to take pride in progress as proving the superiority of Christianity or other religions, saying that Western progress had occurred in the West, that is modern progress because of Christianity, and that Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and so forth did not have the same advantages to offer, and so you had the Ruhr Valley in Germany rather than in India. They took great pride in that. No, no theologian today would ever speak like this anymore. That day is over. But I'm talking about the historical background which led to this. So those people who criticize religion for having a role are to some extent right. But this was not the whole Christian historical tradition. There were days when Christianity produced great mystical thinkers about nature. The Divisione Naturi of Origina is one of the greatest masterpieces in the Latin language about the world of nature. But the last three, four hundred years were marked actually by religion in the West giving up the world of nature. And therefore leaving nature in the hands of two forces. A totally secularized science, which is modern science, which has nothing to do with the transcendent, to which the world, spiritual meaning of nature is totally irrelevant, is purely subjective or non-existent, and of course greed and power over nature, how to milk the cow to give you the maximum of the milk, how to so-called develop. Development is the most dangerous word in the English language for the future of humanity in a certain sense. If you by that mean economic, regular economic development because it means the expansion of something infinitely in a finite space, which means it will explode. And mathematically it's impossible and logically it's impossible. And uh, so for this very, very reason, uh, people were not really concerned with what was going on. These new isms had taken hold and those people who thought of humanity and were humanistic, thought of the future of humanity, never thought that human beings need a home to live in. Even people had good intentions in the 19th century. Fought for the poor, for the uh, oppressed, uh, for uh, this and that. Even Karl Marx, his intentions were not always uh, bad. He was thinking of the plight of the poor, except he was an atheist. And he destroyed religion in trying to help the poor. But the original thing is that a kind of secularized charity. Although Marx was a Jew, Marxism is a secularized Christianity. Because the supreme virtue of Christianity was charity. This is charity without God. That's what Marxism was. And many movements like that were created in the 19th century. So when the environmental crisis really began in the 20th century, Western religion at first didn't want to be concerned with it. It took it a great deal of time to divorce itself from taking pride in having caused the environmental crisis. That is the name of progress, of course, not, not saying environmental crisis, but they're, they're taking a great pride that the West produced modern science and you people couldn't do it. When the Jesuits went to China to, to do missionary activity for Catholicism, what did Father Ricci present to the Chinese? He said, look all the signs that we have that you don't have. He didn't talk about the meekness of Christ and the humility of Christ. He talked about Western science. That's how they convert uh, people in Africa to Christianity by giving them uh, some kind of medicine for the cows, not by just reading the book of John. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not it. So this event was a very, very major central event that shook Western religion. There's no doubt about it. So the story of religion being responsible for the environmental crisis is not true, but there's some truth in what happened in the West. What happened in the West, that is the Western religious view 
except for marginal figures here and there. There are some marginal figures. I will not go into them now, I don't have time. But uh, except so for some marginal figures, left out the significance of the spiritual quality of nature. Nature became the nature of Francis Bacon, something to be manipulated and made use of. As I wrote once in a strong language that nature was turned from being a wife who has legitimate rights to be turned into a prostitute. And so the Western man began to prostitutize nature for the next three centuries until it reached a point when the crisis really began, and that process, of course, has not stopped. I've not been to your city for 20 years, and I've seen half of uh, the city is gone as far as the trees were concerned. Where did the trees go? Where all the beautiful uh, forests that were around here they, they disappeared? And boxes have taken the place which we call apartment houses, uh, with the ugliness that is not unique to your city, but is all over the world. I said, unfortunately, tragically, are two things in which mankind are united. One is the destruction of nature, and was in the, in the creation of ugly atmosphere, ambience in this place. <laughs> so whether in Beijing or Vancouver or Paris or Tehran, my own city where I was born, doesn't matter. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to criticize others that began criticizing myself, but what happened to the city in which I was born, the city of Tehran, everywhere is the same. Everywhere is the same and the cause is the same. The cause is the same, that is the divorce of our understanding of nature from the sacred and the spiritual from the sacred and the spiritual. Now we come to the second factor, secularism. Did that have a role in the environmental crisis? And the answer to that <coughs> is very, very much so. And again, the, now the story is reversed. Uh, secularism was really born after the Middle Ages, but it went step by step. It wasn't that everything in Europe became immediately secularized. There are many villages until a few years ago in Italy before the television came in, which were like medieval villages. People were still living in a religious world, in a sacred world. So it's not, it wasn't that it came immediately, but it went step by step. But the important thing is that it became the dominating paradigm. It took over the universities, the educational system, and therefore people were trained Children were trained, no matter what their parents taught them at home, a secularized view of the world of nature. So even those who were Christian and went to church on Sunday, from Monday until Saturday, they lived in a secularized world. Very little challenge came from the Christian side of what was happening to God's creation, you might say, that is the secularization of the world. So secularism became really the most powerful force. And many of the so-called new social sciences along with the natural sciences, were cultivated in a secularist ambience. Look at political science. We started political science. I'm sure Simon Fraser University has a big department. Two-thirds of all the world's problems today involve religion. But no one ever teaches religion in political science departments. That's taboo. That's taboo, as if it didn't exist. So writing, writing about Vancouver without writing about rain. Thank God we've had no rain the last two days. <laughs> but, but in the long run, in the long run. Uh, I don't want to insult your beautiful city, but uh, uh, it's, it's like that. How can you uh, teach political science, government, in a place like Harvard University or Columbia, these major American universities, as if religion didn't exist, whereas three-fourths of all the problems existing in the world today, even what's happening in Burma, the massacre of Muslims, is, has something to do with religion. Not only the Palestinian-Israeli question, all the what's going on inside the Islamic world, but also outside of the Islamic world, between India and the Muslim and the Buddhist and all kinds of things in Africa, everywhere you see this going on. There are very few, very, very few, in fact, conflicts which do not involve religion. And when they do sometimes, when it's political expedient, it's hidden, like what's happening in Ukraine now. But one of the most important problems, the difference between Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, or Ukrainian Orthodox Christians, and the Catholic Orthodox, uh, that is Orthodox Catholic, who are, who, are, who are on the side of the Vatican. And this goes back to medieval history. I haven't seen a single word about this in any American press. But it's there, almost every conflict today. In a sense, religion came back in the 20th century. 
Uh, and so the conflict is, the, is always involved religion. But put, the sciences that came out during the secularist period usually left religion on the side. Everything became secularized until finally the study of religion itself became secularized. What's going on now in American and Canadian universities in which you teach religion on the condition you don't believe in it. <laughs> it's like teaching music on the condition of being musically deaf. Uh, but, uh, no, that, that's only done for the field of religion, but not for any other field. Of course, we push, there are other possibilities, sometimes, and it's not the same always, but that's the prevalent idea. So in such an atmosphere, everything that we looked upon was looked upon intellectually from the secularist point of view. Western philosophy became secularized, Western sociology, psychology, various disciplines, and it was quite obvious, therefore, that the environmental crisis would never be seen as a crisis from a secularist point of view, because if you do not accept the sacred quality of nature, if that is destroyed, nothing is destroyed. It didn't exist to start with. You only talk about certain parameters until human life itself becomes threatened, until ecosystems become threatened. And that happens gradually in the early 20th century and the very word ecology enters into the English language in a new meaning, which now we call environment. Uh, before, it used to be called ecological studies, environmentalism has come to the fore, but dominated by secularism. So there's no doubt about that, that the beginning of in study of the environment in the West begins from a secular point of view. And most of the people who really began the environmental movement, brought the consciousness of the environmental movement to America, which was the motor for the destruction of the world from an industrial point of view, everybody else was copying what was going on in America, were young American people who had really opposed the whole uh, uh, thesis of their own civilization. They, were called, they came to be known as hippies in the 1960s. They were really quite remarkable young men and women, most of them from well-to-do families. They didn't go with the classical theories of sociologists that all this comes from poverty, non total nonsense. And they didn't come from poverty at all. It came from well-to-do families. Uh, uh, the young no longer found meaning in life, and so they rejected the Western way of life, and they turned to alternatives, including the love of nature, including the Native American tradition and the love of nature, or Asian religions and so forth and so on, all kinds of things that came to the fore. And that gradually brought religion back upon the scene, brought the religion back upon the scene. But paradoxically, as we sit here right now, as we sit here right now, the new age religions, so-called, which are not serious religions, they're all man-made constructs of the 20th century, they are taking little bits here from Buddhism and Islam or, some, or Hinduism or some other religion, putting it together. But, but nevertheless, people who follow these perspectives are much more interested in the environment than the most devout Christians in America. The more devout you are usually in Christianity, the less you're interested in the environment. Like, for example, the Southern Baptists, who are called fundamentalists, Protestant fundamentalists, who will never miss going to church every Sunday. They're the group most opposed to all environmental, serious environmental studies in the United States. And same with the Catholic Church. The people who are really uh, sort of old-style Catholics, they think this is all nonsense, and if the world comes to an end, so much the better, that Christ will come back. And it's only the modernized Catholic who dilute are interested in this. So Christianity in the West has had a tremendous problem of how to come to terms with the environment at a time when uh, its most devout followers have not shown much interest in the environment. Now, the case of other religions of the world is totally different. And I wish I had time here to talk about Hinduism and Buddhism and so I'm not. I'm going to turn right to Islam, the case of Islam. We are criticized oftentimes in the West, and we in this sentence, I mean someone like myself who's a Muslim. Uh, why it is that, let's say, from 50 years ago, when the uh, attention was begun among religious circles in the West to the environmental crisis, why wasn't this done among Muslims? It's a good question. It's a good question. There's a very, very uh, complex set of answers for this. 
First of all, Islam was never secularized as Christianity was. Islamic thought was not secularized in the same way, although in the 18th century there began the so-called reformist movements leading to Wahhabism and things like that, which whittled down the reality of religion, but did not secularize it completely. The consequence, of course, was, leave, was leaving a void so that in Jeddah today, you do not have a single Arabic restaurant. It's all Applebee or McDonald's. At the same time, the Kaaba is just a few miles down the road. This unbelievable paradox of, of, of Wahhabism in which you're supposed to be very devout Muslims, but the latest Western technology fills everything. There's nothing left of Hijazi culture. Uh, so that, that was the consequence of it. But that was very different from having Baal and Karl Marx. That's a very, very different thing. The Islamic worldview never was challenged in the way that the Christian worldview was to secularize it. There once a, a Christian, a good, good friend of mine, was saying that, you know, the difference between you and us is that in the West, there are many people who do not hear the voice of God anymore. I've met Muslims who do not heed the voice of God. I've never met a Muslim who does not hear his voice. <laughs> this is a comment that was made to me by a very profound French Catholic philosopher. It was quite, quite very profound, quite, quite profound. That is, the Muslims did not lose faith in the same way that what, as what happened in the Christian West. Now a few people are, are found here and there, but they're an extremely small minority. So you had a very different uh, dynamic in the fr phenomenon of coming to deal with nature. Now, since all of these major events, which were helping in the destruction of nature and the environment, were taking place in the West, and the Islamic world, like the rest of the world, was simply trying to catch up with the errors of the West. Of course, they were never put in this sense, they're trying to catch up, period. They catch up with what? With either the leftovers of the breadcrumbs of the Western table or with the errors that the West was making. So if the West was polluting rivers, we would pollute the same. So the West will find the solution. I mean, I speak as a person who's spoken in Pakistan and in India and in not only my own country, many, many countries about this issue. And always the argument is, oh, the West has called these problems. They're omnipotent, omniscient. They'll find the solution and we'll get it from them. That's the attitude of most people who are in their inferiority complex, which includes almost all of all the East, with a few exceptions here and there. And that's why, in fact, the minorities living in America, Muslim minorities, can play such an important role in the future for the rest of the Islamic world. But I will not get into that. But anyway, in the Islamic world, this was not, didn't seem to be a problem. When I was in, living in Tehran, the population of Tehran was 300,000, and you could see Mount Damavan, the highest peak in Western Asia, 19,000 foot, beautiful Mount Damavan, from the roof of our house. Now you can't even see your cousin's house next room because of the pollution. <laughs> Not to talk about Mount Damavan. Uh, and uh, at that time, nobody realized what was coming about. And so the waking up to this crisis has been much, much slower. And there have been exceptions. Sheikh Keftaru, who was the Grand Mufti of Syria, before this great tragedy befell this wonderful country, he died. He was a real environmentalist. It was amazing, he was a grand mufti. I was a very good friend of mine, and I'm not a mufti, I'm not a, a religious figure in that sense, I have a lot of freedom to say things but that people don't. But he always was a grand mufti of Syria, was a person who spoke in these terms. And he wanted the, the mullahs of Fridays to preach about the environment in mosques all the time. But here a great problem came up in the Islamic world which the West does not have. And that is that almost every Islamic country, what the preachers preach on Friday is ordered by the government, controlled by the government. It's such a wonderful free country like Egypt where you now have democracy carried out through what I call a mudata instead of a coup d'etat, which is what they call in Washington so that Americans will continue to pay money to the army that carried the coup d'etat which is against American law to do it. Uh, in such a country, even during the time of Mubarak, nobody had the complete freedom to preach whatever they wanted. You just went a little bit out of line, you disappeared for a while, and you probably were exiled to Kuwait or somewhere like that soon. Uh, that's why you have so many Egyptians in Kuwait. Uh, and 
even in a place like uh, Malaysia, where my dear friend Dr. Ba Osman Baka comes from, it's not like 30, 40 years ago. The, the Friday sermons are closely watched and controlled. Now, one of the things these governments do not like is anything that would stultify what they believe to be economic progress. And so there is a very strong opposition, government-wise, in the United States, in Islamic country, but does not exist in the United States, in order to be able to bring up environmental issues. I'm not saying this is 100%. I, never, I didn't say that. But it's, it's much stronger than in the West. I mean, a minister uh, preaching on some Sunday morning, even in North Carolina, if he gets up and talks about that God doesn't want you to destroy his nature, he's not going to be put into prison. But as somebody is saying something like that in Cairo, maybe his, that might be his last sermon. Uh, uh, that, so you have this problem, the practical problem. The practical problem is extremely important because although most Muslim governments don't really care whether there's economic progress or not, they just want to remain in power. But to remain in power, they have to talk about economic progress. And so anyone who, who tries to stop the so-called uh, jump forward uh, is then opposed by political forces. But on a deeper level, on a deeper level, the Islamic world has a much easier path than does the Christian world in dealing with the environmental crisis. First of all, it has not had 400 years of a secularized history. Classical Islamic thought is much more impregnated by philosophies of nature. Islamic poetry, Persian, Arabic, Urdu, uh, Sindhi, all the different languages are full of nature poetry, which are not nature poetry as we call it in English because we would consider all the time to be secular, secularized. People didn't, Christian didn't like nature poetry usually. They're profoundly religious by nature poetry. I mean, many of you come from the subcontinent of India. If you were a bit older, I would quote some poems for you from Saadian Hafez and so forth, like Bejahan Khurramazan and Bejahan Khurramazust. That is a very famous poem of Saadi, Aashagam Barhame Olam Khurramazust. Olam Azust. That is, I am joyful with the world because the world belongs to him. I love the world of nature because God loves that world of nature. And, uh, it's very beautiful poems in the Persian language and similar ones in Arabic and so forth. Our culture was impregnated from the very beginning by a refusal to separate nature and supernature. This is one of the weaknesses of classical Christian theology which made the secularization of nature so easy in the West. In fact, you don't even have the separation in Islamic languages very easily. And the words sometimes used now are contrived. The translation, modern translation. If you read Avicenna or Sohrabardi, there's no word for nature and supernature in the sense that you read medieval European texts. So the Islamic world intellectually has it much more easy and culturally much more easy. Because our culture, as I said, like poetry, prose, histories, and so forth and so on, are replete with a kind of cosmic dimension of Islam. And that goes back to the Quran. The Quran addresses not only human beings, but also the cosmos. Of all the sacred scriptures of the world, with the exception of the Tao Te Ching, the sacred scripture of Taoism, which is almost equal to Quran. No other scripture speaks as much about nature. You take all the verses, in the New Testament, there's no reference to nature. But if you take the Old Testament uh, references in Genesis, Deuteronomy, and so forth and so on, I'll add them all up together. They are just a small amount compared to all of these verses in the Quran. Of the 6,000 some verses in the Quran, over a third directly are related to nature or speak about nature in one way or another. Even God swears by natural things, by the pomegranate, by the sun and the moon. The verse that he read, uh, the sun and the moon prostrate themselves before God. There's a very, very strong sense in the Quran that Islam is not only for human beings. It's a cosmic reality. All creatures participate in Islam. And this is so strong and so powerful 
that uh, if Muslims really come to themselves, it's much easier to be able to develop an environmental philosophy which would not be incongruent or with the religion or artificial, as if you uh, add an artificial tail to a donkey. Uh, it's part and parcel of the Islamic worldview. That's what for centuries many missionaries accused of Islam Muslims of being naturalistic of Islam being a naturalistic religion. And even the great Sufis and mystics were called natural mystics, whereas Christians were called supernatural mystics. All that nonsense that now has disappeared, even among Catholic writers, they don't write things like that anymore. But even until 40, 50 years ago, Jacques Maritain, people like that used to have this theory of natural and supernatural mysticism, mystique naturel, mystique surnatural, things like that. Uh, and, uh, Christians, when they were attacking Islam in centuries past, always saw Islam as being naturalistic, as if it didn't come from God. But now, of course, uh, things are very different. This, what appeared to uh, enemies of Islam at that time as being simply naturalistic, shows the integrative power of Islam in being able to integrate the natural and the human. They're not separated from each other. They're intertwined. The word that is used for this wonderful journal, Sacred Web, is really a Quranic term, deep down metaphysically. There's a web that connects us all to God. And that is not only human beings, all creatures. Kullu shayin yusabahu bihamdihi, the Quran says. It's not only us, kullu shayin, all things, him, the praise of God. And so there is this uh, community that we share with all creatures. Birds are called communities in the Quran. It's not only the community in Vancouver or Toronto of human beings. Bees, birds, everything has its own community. And there's the total community, which really is the total creation of God. And there's nothing outside of that. And it's so easy to develop an Islamic, an authentic Islamic philosophy of the environment. It's not so difficult to do. I've done my share. I'm not going to be writing anymore about these matters, inshallah. Other people better than I will come along and complete what I've been doing for many, many decades, and I've written a great deal on this. But an unbelievably rich tradition to be able to revive a philosophy which is needed more than anything. Otherwise, I'm just to quote Sadi and then pollute Tehran more and more every day is a kind of suicide. Or read the Quran and then pollute the river next door through all the garbage and the running water, like so many of us do in other parts of the Middle East. This is a kind of suicide. And the Islamic world can no longer afford it, nor can anyone else. Let me conclude, because I want to give you a chance to ask me some questions, and I've spoken almost enough. But there's one more point I want to say. Uh, the environmental crisis itself, for those who really have eyes to see, have the perspicacity, is both the proof of God's transcendence and the proofs of the interconnected of all, connectedness of all beings. John Donne wrote, no man is an island. We human beings are not an island unto ourselves. We cannot be happy without the happiness of the rest of creation. We have killed enough, massacred enough of God's other creatures. Now is the time to pay. And as a kind of Yom al Qiyamah for all of us. And God will judge us in the future whether we are able to live in harmony and peace with the rest of his creation or commit suicide. There is no third choice. And it is great work that is before us. I hope and pray that the Muslims as a whole, and especially groups like the Ismaili community, which have had a long history of very, very profound treatments of this issue, going back to Nasr al-Husro and the great classical writers of 900 years ago, will step forward and provide a leadership and guidance, not only for the Muslims, but perhaps for the whole world. Thank you. <laughs>